you know, why are the regulators, uh, you know, fighting against the industry? What's going on here? So I talk about the Ripple lawsuit, the Grayscale lawsuit, um, and then I talk about the Bitcoin ETF race. Well, what changed? Why is Wall Street here? Why do they want to offer you Bitcoin ETFs? Why are they tokenizing? And then talk about the future of crypto. What does that look like? How is it going to change your life? And what are the investment opportunities? But also, what are the do's and don'ts if you're looking to invest in this uh, asset class? And it's not so much that the SEC sued Ripple, it's the way they went about it. And you can tell there was some sort of agenda here. Um, the fact that Jay Clayton did on his, his way out of the SEC, his last day, what, what's up with that? And then you also throw the founders into that and there's no fraud involved here. We're gonna bully the industry. We're gonna go around shaking down everybody. We're gonna sue any and everybody, even a company we green lighted to go public knowing their business model, talking about Coinbase, of course. We're gonna come back years later and sue them. And not only that, we're gonna throw a bunch of tokens. We're not gonna say why they're securities, but we're gonna say they are. And they're not trying to kill crypto. There's people saying, you know, Elizabeth Warren is trying to kill crypto. No, no, no. BlackRock, Fidelity, and all these guys are not getting Wells notices, right? BlackRock is tokenizing on Ethereum. They have a Bitcoin ETF, and it's the best performing ETF in the history of ETFs. So, Rob, how can these two things be happening in parallel? So as the crypto and digital asset space starts to move forward and it rapidly is progressing, I think there's some things that we need to talk about and to actually document as we move forward into this bull cycle. And to uh, help me out, uh, I brought on a friend of the show. This would be uh, Tony Edward. Tony from Thinking Crypto, thanks for coming on the show for the second time. Rob, thank you for having me. Great to be here. Yes, sir. Yes, exactly. So there's a couple of things we want to talk about. First, we're going to talk about your book in a little bit, which was a, which is a really good read. Yes, right, that one right there. Matter <laughs> of fact, this one right here, or this one right here. And I, it's it, it's it's important to talk about because there's some complex things that are that are that are out there. I think it just helps to kind of demystify the things that are going on. But before we get into that, of course, there is a link in the description for uh, Tony's channel. Tony, I got to tell you, man, you've interviewed some big powerhouses in in the space. It's not just Errol Powell. Uh, there's Brock Pierce, there's, I mean, everybody you can think of. There's Michael Saylor, there's Tom Emmer, Congressman, Warren Davidson, Congressman, and then just a ton of people. So you can check that out. There's a lot of things in here that uh, are even new to me, but let's talk about this book. And you've had some really good, I mean, some great reviews. I mean, not just my reviews, but of course, some forwards. You had uh, Christopher Giancarlo, former CFTC chairman, Crypto Dad. As he talks about, uh, he says he want to understand crypto, really understand it. This is the book to read. Mark Yusko from Morgan Creek, uh, Matt Hogan, Raul Powell. And I think, I think Matt Hogan actually said it perfectly here. And he's the uh, CIO at Bitwise. Tony is one of those rare thinkers in crypto who can take an incredibly complex space and make it easy to understand. It is a rare gift because it's tough. A lot of people make things really difficult. So, Tony, I guess the first question is, <laughs> why the book? And who is this actually for? Yeah, great question. So, you know, it's multifaceted as far as the reasons why I decided to write this book. I've always wanted to write a book going back to when I was little. Just the idea of doing that was fascinating to me. And I'm, I'm a bit of a thinker and I have a lot of thoughts. And I guess that's why I have a podcast, right? I'm constantly putting out information and content. Um, so that was layer one. Layer two is I started encountering a lot of different people in public and different places, even my family members and friends who were very confused about crypto. And right. then FTX really, uh, you know, clouded things for them. It, it even warped their perception of the asset class and what was happening. You know, they would say, wait, isn't that a scam? Didn't that guy, Sam beckman fried steal all the Bitcoins? Um, didn't he kill crypto? Those are statements I would encounter. I'm like, no, no, no. Okay, we got we to gotta take some time to sit down and talk about this and to delineate between a bad actor and the technology. And I often give them the analogy of, hey, Bernie Madoff scammed people in a regulated market. He's a bad actor. But that doesn't mean that stocks and investments are all bad, right? Uh, so you have to differentiate between those things. The, and the challenge is that people often just read headlines. And they, you know, they just see the headlines and the the one a minute uh, talking head saying something, and it's like, oh no, this thing is all scary and a scam, right? But it's uh, obviously not. It's just a bad actor came in. So I wanted to, in the book, educate folks about that. 
what's the technology, what are the pros and cons, and why is Sam Bankman Freed, you know, no, a nobody who just entered in and tried to scam people, same way Bernie Madoff did. And then I wanted to talk about, you know, why are the regulators, uh, you know, fighting against the industry? What's going on here? So I talk about the Ripple lawsuit, the Grayscale lawsuit, mm -hmm. um, and then I talk about the Bitcoin ETF race. Well, what changed? Why is Wall Street here? Why do they want to offer you Bitcoin ETFs? Why are they tokenizing? And then talk about the future of crypto. What does that look like? How is it going to change your life? And what are the investment opportunities? But also, what are the do's and don'ts if you're looking to invest in this uh, asset class? Yeah, well said. And then what, what you said right there, where you talked about, you go, look, a lot of people just look at the headlines. The same thing with us. A lot of people just look at the thumbnails. They become thumbnail investors. They see one headline and go, okay, so this is a collapse of crypto. Crypto equals bad. And that's not really is. There's a lot of details, I think. And, and, and it's not very difficult details, quite honestly. I, I think he did it marvelously in this book to really break things down. So let's do this. Let's break down some of these pieces. And let's first mm -hmm. talk about and even me, who I, I've been in this thing since 2017, and the things that I was reading in your book, especially from the, the perspective of the SBFs, the Caitlin Longs, the Gary Gensler's, the, the Elizabeth Warrens, I was pretty surprised at these different pieces. So I want to break down this, this one piece, which I thought was, uh, was really uh, eye-opening. And we're talking about uh, SPF. And this was an excerpt from your book. He said, when I interviewed Caitlin Long, founder and CEO of Custodia Bank. There she is right there. I'll link her, her profile in the description. She let me know that SBF met with Fed Chair Jerome Powell one hour ahead of FTX acquiring Farmington Bank. Consider for a moment that a tiny number of financiers get a private one hour, one hour meeting with the Fed Chair. It's very rare. And that was, it was interesting, that piece, but there was, and then he went on and she says, and this is Kate Long talking. She says, we have an advisor who's working with Custodia Bank who spent her entire career at the Federal Reserve. She wrote an op-ed in American Banker and said, look, the Fed should have caught this. Alameda, the affiliate of FTX, acquired 80% of the equity of Farmington State Bank. That tripped the control rules that she herself helped right at the Fed. And she firmly said, this should not have happened. And there's a reason why I, I think it didn't happen. But I just want you to touch on this before we get to the next piece, which really talks about the SEC and Chairman Jerome, or excuse me, uh, Gary Gensler and what he actually did. So just talk to that that first piece on for us. Yeah, absolutely. And Rob, you know, it wasn't until crypto that I really started to understand money and politics. Um, mm. Honestly, I was blinded. I was like the average Joe and Jane, just, you know, listening to talking heads on TV, but not doing the research myself. Who's making campaign donations? What what bills are they putting together? What what is their agenda? You know what are they saying? What are the fine print details behind uh, you know the, the 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 headlines and so forth? And what we're seeing here with Sam Bankman Fried getting this one hour meeting and getting uh, favorability from the Fed and other folks in D.C. is money. Money moves politics, man. I mean, I should come as no surprise to many people, right? But. <laughs> It, it it's clear Sam Bankman-Fried was making massive amounts of campaign donations. He was going to DC, buddying up with people. We we've, we've seen photos of him taking, uh, well, photos of him and Maxine Waters and so forth. Photos they want to burn and bury now, of course. Um, but the point is, they didn't do their due diligence and they were blinded by the money. Right, that's what happened here. Same thing with the SEC. Sam Bankman-Fried met with Gary Gensler multiple times. Gary's and the SECs are, are supposed to protect investors. And obviously, this is a, a, a really big black stain on the Fed and, and the government. And uh, they really dropped the ball here. And, and it, it was just like, oh, this guy has a lot of money and he's coming in. Let's let's see what we can do for him. Right. Because he's made X amount of campaign donations. And as Caitlin said, how the hell did he get a, an hour meeting with the Fed? That is not an easy thing. But as you can imagine, some phone calls were probably made, right? He's all right. He's, he's, you know, he donated X amount and yada, yada. So it shows that many of these politicians, we have to keep them accountable because they're blinded by money and, and power. You know, if they can get, you give them a $10 million check in different ways, you know, they'll, they'll probably do anything for you. Yeah. And, and you know what? It's a, it's a funny thing. It's not just about the money, but it's the other part about, it's not, it's not, what you know it's who you know and i mm -hmm. think that is that is another aspect of this whole piece that even went beyond me 
And that's why, like, when you were talking about this, this was, uh, I think this was you and uh, the Mooch, Anthony Scaramucci, when you interviewed him. And he laid it out very simply. There was a, a blind spot for yeah. Chair Gary Gensler and the CFTC Chair Ross and Venom. Sam Bakeman fried bought the credibility. They hired Ryan Miller, FTX's general counsel, who previously served as legal counsel to Gary Gensler. I had no idea that was a thing. Mm -hmm. But then CFTC chair and now the SEC's chairman, uh, Mark Wetchin, for FTX's former head of, uh, head of policy and regulatory strategy and current director at Ledger X, an FTX affiliate, formerly served as the acting chairman and commissioner at the CFTC after being nominated by President Obama. SBF also put Jill Summers, another former CFTC commissioner on the FTX board of direct. And this is, again, it's just, it's not just about the money right there, but it's the mm -hmm. illusion of everything's safe, everything's good, because we're playing by the rules by the people you know. And that, I think, is a confirmation bias. So just talk to us real quick about that and what it all means. Yeah. And this is where <clears throat> you would think regulators and these people in the government would do their due diligence. It, you know, maybe in the, uh, a pr private sector um, where, you know, you know, somebody, you do business together, like you and I may do business together. You may give me the benefit of the doubt, but if you're a regulator, I mean, you, you got to come on, you got to go down the checklist, right? And, yeah. and they didn't. And part of that, like you're saying, is um, a friend of a friend or, you know, there's some connections here of who you know. Remember, his parents are politically connected as well. So I think there was a layer to that. Oh, he, this is the Bankman Fried kid, um, you know, whatever it is. Um, and, you know, his parents have been, I think, uh, donors to, to sure. the certain political parties. So I think that was that, there was that layer. But it, the government failed here um, in doing their due diligence. And the fact that this guy was operating in the Bahamas, and not there's nothing necessarily wrong with that, but... He's trying to get into the U.S. and he's operating outside and they they didn't take, think to just check in and see what's going on. What's going on with Alameda? Why is Alameda the one getting a big chunk of this Farmington State Bank? Like, why is it not FTX? You know, no one asked these questions. It's, it's just strange that that took place. Yeah. You know, it's, it's strange, but it's tough when you know when your friends are in the same industry and you look at that and go, well, I know this guy. And I know he's on the up and up because I worked with him before, but it was one of those things where there was, it was contained. I think Scaramucci talked about this. It was contained within three or four people at FTX, as opposed to branching out into 50. Because when you have so many people, then someone's going to raise their hand and say, hey, there's something going on here. But when you can contain those things, then you can have these Ponzi schemes, then you can have these scams and, and move forward. And before we, we go to the next part, I will just say that... Uh, when you get all these people together and they and they say that this is what it is, remind everybody right now watching the video, everything's a scam until proven otherwise. You can't trust them. You can't trust me. You can't trust Tony. You cannot trust anybody. Do not trust. You need to verify. And that's why it's so important that you get information from outside your echo chamber. If you take a look at Tony's book, take a look at somebody else and you know, even follow somebody else who's, who's outside the, our, our whole realm of crypto digital assets to get yep. the full picture. Absolutely. That's a great point, Rob. And one of the things I've learned over the years, um, not just with crypto, but, you know, listen to what the critics are saying. Right. Do they have any valid points? And I think we want to be intellectually honest. And I had to do that with crypto because there was a point in my in the early stages um, trying to learn about this. People were saying this is a scam or this is this and that. And I was like, you know, what? maybe it is. Let, let me go listen to what they have to say now. You want to listen to people who are credible, of course, and they're providing data and facts, not just uh, their opinion, because anybody can pop up any day and give an opinion, right? <laughs> uh, but are they backing it up? What, what does the data say? Or did it put together any research or uh, analysis, right? Do they have some sort of literature behind it? So great point, Rob. And, and part of that is what I mentioned in the book. Don't, don't trust, verify. And, um, you know, because of this crash, I highlighted that many of the uh, folks in the industry started doing proof of reserves, exchanges, mm -hmm. um, taking security to the next level. And, you know, in hindsight, you look back and you're like, why were these things not in place? But you live and you learn. And this is where when you're examining exchanges or projects, you know, who are they custodying with? Uh, what are the security layers? Are they SOC 1 or SOC 2 compliant? All these different layers, you, you want to make sure they're they're there. Yeah, and, and so just piggyback on that, it's it's because pain is the best teacher. We're never going to get pushed forward if everything just goes smooth as silk. 
you have to go through the hard times and you have to learn a lot of things. The reason why I have these rules over here is because of the FTXs, the Celsius, the Voyager, the BlockFi's, because of those screw ups. And without those, we wouldn't really be able to teach the people moving forward like, hey, this is what I've learned and it really sucked. This is how you should really you know, think about moving forward. I just think it's one of those things. Hey, uh, and I, I, I wanna talk about this too, because like you talked about like, hey, you know, like I, I, I take different opinions and even like uh, taking a look at crypto might be an issue. And, you, and we're gonna get to the whole diamond hands and taking profits at the very last part. But talk to us real quick, because there was another section that was really good about the ripple loss and what it actually means moving forward as far as like in the whole crypto as a whole. How did that all, you know, what did you see and what was more like uh, eye-opening to you? Yeah, you know, like many folks, I was blown away by that Ripple lawsuit. Yeah. And it's not so much that the SEC sued Ripple, is the way they went about it. And you can tell there was some sort of agenda here. Um, the fact that Jay Clayton did on his, his way out of the SEC, his last day, what, what's up with that? And then you also throw the founders into that and there's no fraud involved here. So mm -hmm. they tried to, I think, use Ripple as an example, try to make an example of, out of them. However, they weren't, they the, because they went a, with that direction, they were kind of blinded as to what would actually stick in court. And we saw, uh, you know, years later, the judge said, hey, wait a minute, uh, this token intrinsically is not a security. Secondary market sales are not a security. And the SEC actually had to drop the lawsuit against Brad Garlinghouse and, and Chris Larson. So you, you see the SEC now, is, now has egg on their face. Um, but the reason I wanted to document that story is because it was the start of the massive enforcement actions against the crypto industry. It wasn't just, uh, oh, Ripple got sued in XRP. No, it was, we're kicking off this campaign the, these enforcement actions against the crypto industry. We're going to bully the industry. We're going to go around shaking down everybody. We're going to sue any and everybody, even a company we greenlighted to go public, knowing their business model. I'm talking about Coinbase, of course. We're going to come back years later and sue them. And not only that, we're going to throw a bunch of tokens. We're not going to say why they're securities, but we're going to say they are and, uh, and kind of attach it to this lawsuit. Uh, we're going to stop cracking from staking. Um, and we're going to do much more. So it's important to understand what's going on here and how the SEC as an agency has become political as well as, uh, I would say, corrupt. They, they've fallen far from their core values of protecting investors. Um, I'm not calling for the abolishment of the, uh, uh, the SEC. I think they have a role to play. There are bad actors. There are people trying to do scams. But we see the SEC is not so much focused on that as they are attacking good actors, right? Once again, even companies they've greenlighted to go public. So it's a mess, Rob. Um, if you step back and look at it, it's it's a really uh, big mess. And now the SEC is trying to backtrack on Ethereum, right? Bill That's Hinman right. under Jay Clayton said, Ethereum is not a security, sufficiently decentralized. Now, Genser will not echo those statements. And it's they're sending Wells Notice to uh, Consensus and the Ethereum Foundation. What a mess. It's, yeah, it's a huge mess. And, you know, I mean, this would lead us to, to, to the next point, but you've already actually made it. And we're going to talk about Operation Choke Boy 2.0, which is essentially what's going on now, which I believe that was coined by, by Nick Carter. But that, I see it happening. And, and we talked about on the show, we've talked about not just what has happened in the past, but what's happened just in the last couple of weeks. We've seen uh, a Wells notice, which was given out to Robinhood, which was just last week. We've seen more Wells Notice going out to Coinbase, like you talked about. Kraken has received multiple legislation against it. So in all your research that you've seen it, and we're going to talk about, you know, and kind of bring in CBDCs, what do you think, and why is this actually happening, like, right now? It seems like mm -hmm. Gary Gens on the SEC, they're not very successful in the courtroom, yet they still keep going down this road. Why is that? And what's going to happen? I mean, in your research that you can you can tell in the future, Rob, we are in the then they fight you phase, right? Yeah. First they ignored us, they laughed at us. Now, oh shit, this thing is becoming big. It's becoming real. People are actually putting their money into this. People are building with this. Wait, mm -hmm. you can move money faster without going through J.P. Morgan without paying ridiculous fees to rest Western Union. You can use a stablecoin. 
Rob, they are scared. Um, and part of the agenda, in, in, from my opinion and research, they're not trying to kill crypto. There's people saying, you know, Elizabeth Warren is trying to kill crypto. No, no, no. BlackRock, Fidelity, and all these guys are not getting Wells notices, right? BlackRock yeah. is tokenizing on Ethereum. They have a Bitcoin ETF, and it's the best performing ETF in the history of ETFs. So, Rob, how can these two things be happening in parallel? How can Gary Genter go on TV and say, these are all scam securities and it's right foot fraud, yet I can go buy Bitcoin from BlackRock, yet BlackRock's tokenizing on Ethereum, Citibank and JP Morgan are tokenizing on Avalanche? How can these two things be happening at the same time? The point is Wall Street and the TradFi want to take over, not kill crypto. They want to own it. Think of this, Rob. Hmm. The fact that you and I are taking our money out of our checking and savings accounts, which gives us bullshit interest, right? <laughs> I can go park it in USDC and earn incredible yield and interest. I can also stake and earn a great return. And I can put it into an asset that Paul Tudor Jones, billionaire Paul Tudor Jones said, is the fastest horse in the race and make big returns. That means my capital left a Goldman Sachs, JP Morgan investment account and checking and savings account, and they don't have those that fund anymore or, or those funds anymore, I should say. True. What does that mean for them? They've lost out on being able to leverage that and lend it out and do mm -hmm. much more, right? So if you are JP Morgan, Jamie Dimon, you don't like that capital leaving and going into an asset you can't touch and custody yet. And that's where um, like SOB 121, the SEC's rule, uh, House is about to uh, repeal that. It, it prevents banks from custody in crypto. Um, so mm. that is what's happening here, Rob. It, it's the TradFi fighting back. They want to control it. This technology is here to stay. So they're not trying to kill crypto. They, they can't kill crypto. Crypto is global, but they want to control it. They want to leverage it. They want to put it in their custody so that they can then do what the hell they want with it, right? Um, the other layer is, uh, and a shout out to Rao Powell, who, who opened my eyes to this. The government wants to tax everything. And if they can't see where your money is going, if it's going to a stable coin or it's on this network, they're not set up to, to, to figure that out yet. So they can't tax it. And also, when you have a debt-based system that you're printing money, you kind of need to, you need to know where that money is going um, because you're trying to control inflation and much more. This is a blind spot for them. They can't they don't know everything yet. They know some of it, but uh, they're they're trying to catch up. And and companies like Chainalysis and so forth are, are doing the work. Um, so there's there's those layers, right? To catch up, the incumbents to catch up and to understand uh, where the capital is going and to tax it. Gotcha. You know what? That makes a lot of sense. Because I was I was always wondering, I'm like, why? You know, we have the, the, these two entities kind of fighting against each other. How is it that we got the Black Rocks, the Fidelities, and all those, you know, those big you know, Wall Street players? And then we got everybody over here, the bankers kind of fighting. Now it makes uh, total sense. I, and also, I would think about this. There's a reason why there was a, there was a bill that's looking to ban self-custody wallets, which would mm -hmm. make a lot of sense because if you can ban a self-custody wall and go, okay, now it's only custody wallets. Now that they're custody in these centralized exchanges, we know where all this money's going to, and we can tax that, which makes total sense. Because if you don't do that, you can kind of get around the system. And the last thing I'll say before we, before I move on is, it is Elizabeth Warren, and we talked about her before, and she's building this, this, this coalition against crypto. It's amazing to me because I saw her, you know, years ago, and she was rallying against the banks. And now all of a sudden she's very cozy with Jamie Dimon and talking to him. And I'm like, what happened here? Because if, if, if anything, if she talks about, you know, the, the problems with payday loans and the problems with these banks and the problems with the interest and the problems with the fractional reserve lending and all this stuff, if she would just take a look at that and go, okay, there's no reason for me to against, be against crypto. Like you just talked about, this could actually solve a lot of problems. It just, I don't know what happened, but again, maybe it goes back to your point about money and power. Oh yeah. Well, 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 Rob, I mean, people have done, uh, the, the, well, shown the data, her salary versus her net worth. Oh. She didn't earn those additional hundreds of millions of dollars with a part-time job. <laughs> <laughs> she got kickbacks and, and big time. And, you know, one of the things I've learned about Elizabeth Warren is that a lot of the things she's been peddling for years is just a facade. It's a narrative that she puts out there. But the truth is she's working with the banks. She just does this dog and pony show, the show that, oh, you know, I'm I'm against these guys. But I think you see 
uh, it's coming to light now because crypto is forcing it to come to light. She's partnering with these banks and uh, and she's one of the, I, I would say, the most corrupt politicians out there. Now, I know there's some listeners who say, well, she's for women's rights and so forth. And I'm not against that. I'm not against right. that. But, but let's segment for a second. Just know who you're dealing with and what she says. Uh, I'm for the common man. I'm against establishment. That's a lie. That's a lie. Yeah. Like you, you can't just go against everybody because of, you know, just, just one thing. Like I love my brother, but he's a Raiders fan. I can't, I, I, I can't let that slide, but that's just how it is. So it's just, just one piece. Sure. Whatever. All right. So moving on, Tony, let's talk about this. Dexes, smart contracts, NFTs. And I like this part where you put it into your book. You kind of like explained it, make, make things simple, but where do you see things going as far as like through all your research? Cause I look at, centralized exchanges and, and they have their place now, but I see DEX is really starting to play a larger role in that. Smart contracts, of course, what those are. And then the NFTs, because NFTs for a lot of people in crypto, let's be honest, they're goofy pictures. So <laughs> when, I, when I think about this, I'm like, is there really a future for NFTs? And you had a good point. So talk about that real quick. Absolutely. Look, I'll, I'll be first, the first to tell you, I want to make money. I'm here to make money. But I, I'm also very passionate about this technology. It is the next layer on top of the internet and is going to change the way we do commerce and transact with each other, right? Um, <clears throat> smart contracts and so forth are going to cut out a lot of middlemen and a lot of middlemen fees. That's great for the future where people can go directly and, and do business with each other and they can trust each other because of the blockchain. So that will be disrupting real estate and car sales and much more. These things are in motion. Um, with decentralized exchanges, is the same idea where you're eliminating a middleman and essentially, you know, being able to transact with people directly uh, to a certain degree. Um, I think de decentralized exchanges will grow in prominence um, because we're seeing a lot of failures with centralized exchanges. Obviously, FTX was, was a clear example. Now, don't get me wrong. Many of these centralized exchanges took steps to improve their uh, transparency, security, having proof of reserves. Although in the short term, I believe there's going to be a merge of centralized and decentralized exchange uh, attributes, right. and and that will help you know bring on board the next billion people who may be turned off by decentralized exchanges because it's all new to them. But eventually, I think ten years from now, Dan, decentralized exchanges will be bigger than centralized exchanges, in my opinion, because we would have future iterations where it's much easier for people to use. People can trust it and so on and so forth. I think there's a educational awareness campaign that needs to be done uh, about blockchain for the, the, you know, the masses. And I think world governments are going to do that with CBDCs, but that's a later topic. No. Um, and then with NFTs, uh, you know, going back to the smart contract technology item, uh, it's going to go beyond artwork. And don't get me wrong. There's a market for artwork and collectibles. But the real world application of NFTs, I'm really excited about, um, especially like dynamic NFTs where they're programmable. They will do things based on change of events in the world. So you can put your house on, on a, uh, an NF, in an NFT format and it will be updated. Let's say you do a maintenance. I just changed the HVAC or whatever. Gotcha, gotcha. It'll document that and, and it's incorruptible, right? It's on the blockchain and it can live there and anybody can go take a look at it. Deeds will go on, on the blockchain via NFTs. I think a lot of uh, a car insurance policies and these different things will go on the blockchain. And I think uh, uh, you're going to start to see NFTs pop up for airline tickets, reward programs, movies, music uh, tickets, uh, concerts, and so forth, where it unlocks additional benefits. And you can create a secondary market for it, uh, where I can lend out a certain exclusive NFT that in, you know includes certain perks. Because let's say I'm a Taylor Swift fan and she does uh, uh, 10,000 exclusive NFT tickets, which unlock future benefits. Maybe, I don't know, meet her, uh, you know, special uh, event passes, you name it, right? Anything that's exclusive can be programmed in an NFT. And once again, the secondary market benefits are going to be incredible because eventually you'll be able to lend that out, uh, rent it out and ma make passive income or obviously re resell it on the open market for a profit. Yeah, you know, it's a it's a good point, especially the points about real estate, because we, we've talked about this before, because, of course, if if you're going to do anything with real estate, it would be, you know, land, commercial or retail, you know, you have to go through, through, through the broker's office, you have to sign a ton of, of documentation. A lot of those fees are actually the recording fees 
to go to the county, the, the, the city, and, the, and or the state. And of course, if you can reduce some of those fees, then it's the overall fee reduction for everybody who's buying the house or the property or what, whatever it actually, actually is. I think if you can do something like that, and then like you talked about, like there are certain properties I've bought in the past that I'm like, where did these leaks come from? You know, what happened? There was supposed to be an inspection. And, and of course, there's not really anything documented. But if you can have something like that where it's documented, like here for, you know, for there's a, there was an insurance policy for this, this electrical fire, there was an insurance policy for, the, for this leakage, then you can kind of take a, a better assumption of what the actual price could actually be. And the only way to do that would be on an incorruptible type of uh, NFT on a blockchain space. So I can kind of see that. That makes sense. Absolutely. And Rob, I'll share a little uh, part of my history. At one point, I worked in the um, real estate industry as a, 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 or more on the, the mortgage side, where I was yeah. a loan processor. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. I saw people put white out on appraisals and, and Photoshop stuff. So <laughs> I, shit happens. And this is where NFTs and this technology is going to, you know, uh, help people to avoid scams and, and to get uh, fraud, uh, you know, lied to and, and all these things. So, um, it's going to help eliminate a lot of the problems that we've had le legacy wise. You know what? I, I see something like that happening. And then also with, with the advent of, of artificial intelligence, AI and the videos that are out there, like mm. I see videos these days. I'm like, is that real? Like everything I see now, I'm like, that's, is that fake or is that real? And I'm getting really worried about moving into, cause our presidential election is coming up here in the States. Yeah. I don't know what's going to happen with those videos, but I think it's going to be just just in bananas of what what's but going to be actually put out there. So maybe like NFT could actually be like a digital ID moving forward and actually prove these things. But who knows? Yeah, and I don't know if you saw uh, some of the news. I think it was Fox News. They partner with Polygon to build a oh. platform to help validate their content. And like you said, man, this is going to be a big problem. Uh, it, right now, you could. You know, some there's little flaws that you can say. Oh wait, you know I, I, that looks a little fishy. But man, five years from now, Rob, you wouldn't be able to tell. Like if I'm an AI talking to you, or a real person. It, as with technology moves fast, there's going to be further iterations, and uh, it's a scary time. But this is where we have a solution at least with blockchain. Man, I hope so. So speaking of solutions, let's let's bring everything full circle because in the beginning you talked about you know getting into the space and the things that you've actually learned, and then there was. There in the book, in the very last section, there's these nine tips, mm -hmm. nine tips of digital asset investing. So I want you to talk about that and then talk about how, as far as like taking profits, how in the early days, what you thought about taking profits and what do you think about as far as taking profits now? Absolutely. So, you know, I wanted to make sure I left the readers with um, some tips, especially if they're new to crypto, yeah. what to look out for. You know, uh, things, mistakes I've made, and I want people to learn from them. And even some of my friends in crypto who have made mistakes and what to watch out for, because uh, as always, there is bad actors. There are bad people in civilization and society, and they uh, enter into any asset class, any technology to try to take advantage of people. So that's a given, right? That's that's human civilization. Um, so we have to be uh, vigilant and we have to watch out, especially it's, it's our money. We want to invest it appropriately and we don't want to get rug pulled or scammed. So I provide a list of things and checks that people can do when they're looking at a project, uh, looking and investigating the founder and the CEO and whoever else and looking if they have a digital trail, what's their track record, who are they partnered with? Um, you know, are they a real business entity? Uh, do they are they on LinkedIn? Can you readily identify uh, the people who are the developers and so forth, right? They're not cloaked or hidden. <laughs> it's not like, wait, when did this token pop up? Who is behind yeah. it, right? Yeah. You should be able to identify those things because if they're not there, there's a, a strong probability and chance that you're going to get in, fall into some sort of trap here. Um, so I, I outline a variety of tips and um to help point point people in the right direction, talk a bit about you know investigating your ta local tax laws because that's important. Um, some people may think, hey, I don't have to pay taxes on crypto. You do capital gains, especially if you're in the, uh, in the United States. Mm -hmm. And then you know with taking profits, Rob, I've learned if you if you are in the green man and you're up, you got to take money off the table. I I've gone through a bull market cycle where I thought it was going to keep going up. And I lost out on significant profits. And it, sometimes we we have this as human beings, we get excited and we get euphoric and you mm -hmm. see the run up and everybody's talking and you think it's not going to end. It ends. The, <laughs> the bear is waiting for you, right? <laughs> 
it doesn't last forever and you have to take money off the table. And uh, sometimes people have the mindset and I'm speaking from experience. Oh, I want to hit this number. I'm going to make a million this cycle. That may not happen. You may walk away with a few hundred thousand, but that's okay. You walked away with profits because we just don't know how high a token will go. There are different factors, liquidity. Uh, is there something wrong with the project? Did they just put out a whole bunch of tokens? The tokenomics matter. There's so many factors and you have to pay attention to the charts, follow great uh, analysts and so forth who are charting and looking, hey, we might be close to the top. I better start taking some profits off the table and dollar cost average out the same way you dollar cost average in. It's a good point. We've been preaching that on, on this channel for a while now because in the beginning, I got duped just like you got duped in 2017. <laughs> I heard the diamond hands narrative, never going to go down. John McAfee came out and told me it's going to a million dollars. Bitcoin's going to a million. I, well, he would never lie. So <laughs> I just thought to myself, if I just hold forever, it's going to work out. Now, some people will say, well, I'm just going to hold XYZ, Bitcoin, Ethereum forever and, and leave it to my grandkids. That's fine. You can do that. And it's, it's up to you. We can't give you financial advice. But I think, Tony, what you talked about, just taking a little bit off the table sometimes is not a bad strategy moving forward. And the great thing about that, Rob, if you do that, you build your pool of capital to reinvest, to grow the portfolio. Um, and that's something I've been doing. So I, I, my strategy is segmented. And by no means am I telling people to, to follow me here. Uh, I have a long-term hold bag, which I'm playing the four-year cycles, right? So mm -hmm. I'm not touching anything. And then I have a swing trade bag. This is not using leverage. This is simply, um, okay, render, just pull back. And I kid you not, a, a couple of weeks ago, I bought it as Bitcoin was coming down. It's now up. I can sell that for a profit and continue to pull the capital to reinvest. And then when I take profits at the euphoric peak zone, I don't want to say, cause I don't know the exact top, but the zone area, the range, I'm then going to take some of that money. Obviously I got to pay taxes, pay yeah. off a little bit of debt, um, put some of it into retirement and guess what? Reinvest some of it uh, to, for the next bull market cycle. That's my strategy. And, and folks need to understand you can be multifaceted if you're able to, to do that. I could have said it better. Tony, that's a great, great way to leave it right there. I want to remind everybody, first of all, Tony, thanks for coming on again for the second time and taking the time to, to stop by. I appreciate it. But for you at home, if you're looking, the, the book is fantastic and it's relatively inexpensive for some really good tips, tricks, and also some things that you, I didn't even know. Again, I've been here since 2017. Looks like it's, depending on where you're at, I mean, you can buy it on Kindle for only $10, $18, and it's a good, and also, not only is, is it great for you yourself, but if you if you have those stubborn friends, family, loved ones who just don't get it, and you don't want to deal with them, just like, here's a book, just read this, because I don't have time for you. Exactly, and and it gives the the holistic view, you know, not just FTX, we, we, we kind of know what happened there, but, um, what does the future look like? And, and once again, why is Wall Street here? You should be paying attention to that. They're not here for fun. They see the potential. They, they, they're, you know, they're not here for, oh, yeah, this might do OK. It might, it might make it some No, they know it's going to because this is the future. The blockchain on top of the Internet is the future. Yeah, Larry Fink's not here because of charity. Anyhow, yeah. everybody, thanks so much for stopping by. Look, if you like today's video, give it a thumbs up. Consider subscribing when we talk about it's time sensitive. Tony, thanks again for stopping by. We appreciate it. Everybody, links in the description, and we'll see you on the next one. Thanks, Rob.